So we have talked about, so we want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize the function fx such that hx equals to zero, gx is less than equal to zero. H is a function from Rn to Rm. G is a function from Rn to Rr. X is an Rn. Okay, so this is a problem that we would like to solve. We want to compute the X star and the corresponding Lagrange multipliers uh, for this particular problem. So, so far we have talked about two algorithms. One is the barrier method where I have some inequality constraints and I create a barrier function. Um, this is my barrier function B of X and I add it to the objective function F of X and, and then I try to minimize the weighted sum of the function and the barrier function. Okay, so that's the first method. The second method was augmented Lagrangian method. Where instead of minimizing the uh, original objective function over the constraints, we com constructed an augmented Lagrangian term uh, this is for the equality constraint, but there is an augmented Lagrangian term for the in inequality constraint problem as well. Okay. And assuming that C is large and lambda equals to lambda star, we had argued that x star equals to argmin, the unconstrained argmin of LCX lambda star. Okay, so the op optimal solution to the original problem is actually an unconstrained minimum of the augmented Lagrangian, assuming C is sufficiently large and lambda is equal to lambda star. Okay, any questions about these two methods? No questions? Perfect. So let's move on to the next method, which is called the penalty method. And in order to motivate the penalty method, let me just uh, uh, emphasize one important point of augmented Lagrangian method, which is You can view this term as a penalty that you add to the objective function f of x. So you added a penalty term to the objective function so that the unconstrained minimum of certain function is actually the solution to the original problem, right? So, so what did I do? I'm trying to minimize X in Rn, Fx plus some penalty function. Uh, let me write it as P tilde of X, okay? And it turns out that the uh, unconstrained minimum of this function is actually the solution to our original problem. It corresponds to solution X star of original problem. Okay. That's a beautiful way to think about it. So I have an objective function. I add a penalty term to the objective function. I do an unconstrained minimization. And 
under certain conditions, the solution to the unconstrained problem turns out to be a solution to the original problem. So that's very nice. That's a beautiful thing. Of, uh, I mean, that's a beautiful property of augmented Lagrangian method. Now, my question is, um, uh, we kind of understand what this penalty is trying to do in augmented Lagrangian. So there is this lambda transpose HX, which is there because that's part of the Lagrangian. Uh, and the stationary point of Lagrangian, you know, is, is supposed to be the optimal solution. Well, it's a candidate for an optimal solution to the original problem. But there is the C over two H of X square. So what's the property of this, this term C over two norm of HX square? So let's try and think about it. So I have this manifold, which is HX equal to zero. I have this point X star, which is the optimal solution on this manifold. And I have this term C over two norm of HX square. So what does it do? when you go away from this manifold where hx is equal to zero. So what happens at this point, x? So one thing you will notice is that the penalty is actually strictly positive. So C over two norm of hx squared is strictly positive at this point. So as soon as you go out of the, uh, out of this manifold, the penalty term becomes large. So violating the constraint, constraint is penalized in the objective function. Okay. So now you know that in the augmented Lagrangian case, if you are violating the constraint, if you're outside of this manifold where HX is equal to zero, um, you are you are going to be penalized. You're going to pay a heavy price as far as your unconstrained optimization goes. So P tilde X is strictly positive, or maybe I should write much, much greater than zero if H of X is not equal to zero. That's, that's a good, uh, a good property of this penalty function. Now, what I want from you, I, I, I want you to take one or two minutes to think about what could be a good penalty function p tilde of x. I mean, I want some other uh, other idea. So one idea is already here, embedded here, which is c over two norm of hx square. So lambda transpose hx plus c over two norm of hx square. So that's one penalty term. But can you come up with some other penalty function, which also has this property that as soon as you go outside the manifold, you pay a heavy price. Right. Go yeah. Go ahead. There was. Yeah. Any any thoughts?
so if you are violating the constraint gb break man diversion sorry break man diversion breakman divergence okay <laughs> uh breakman divergence between what i mean i think it's a good idea breakman divergence is a good idea but between what So divergence is defined for two points, right? X comma Y. So what's the X and what's the Y here in the Bregman divergence? If if you want to go that route. Any other thoughts? Any other candidates for penalty functions which becomes high as soon as you go out of the manifold? Okay, there's something in the chat window. Exponential of h of x. Okay. So one idea was p tilde x equals to the Bregman divergence between something. So I don't know what that something is. The other idea is p tilde x equals to exponential of minus or exponential of h of x. So if h of x is negative, then the penalty is very, very small. If h of x is positive, then the penalty is very, very high. So this creates a problem. But maybe I can, I can, I can get away with this problem if I assume following the same train of thought. So the problem with this uh, p of x is, p tilde of x is, if h of x is small, like less than zero, then this exponential term is very small. So that makes it, uh, then the penalty is not very high. So there's another chat. Okay, norm of x minus x star square, okay. So let me, let me go over this one. Let me write x minus x star square. Let me make it norm of h of x. Okay, um, so this is this has a desirable property that if h x becomes positive or negative, this term is still, this term still will blow up very quickly. So therefore, this is a valid penalty function. Okay, so this is also a valid penalty function. In fact, we used it in the Lagrange multiplier theorem, um, this sort of penalty function. Uh, but then it requires you to have the knowledge of X star, which is exactly what you're trying to seek. So therefore this penalty function is not very useful. Log minus HX. What happens when HX is positive? Um, so another idea was P tilde X equals to log of minus hx. And then the problem is what happens when hx is positive. So for every hyperplane, you will have one side which is hx greater than zero and other side which is hx less than zero. So the penalty has to be positive along both these areas. Okay, so let me tell you what sort of penalty function is so this penalty function is actually good. Um, I don't know if anyone has used it, but this is certainly a very good penalty function because no matter whether you are going up or going down, uh, you are going to increase the objective function because of this exponential term. So let's, uh, let's look at another penalty function. And this is the penalty function used for sequential quadratic pr 
programming sqp and the penalty function p tilde of x is equal to c where c is some positive number and p of x where p of x is defined as max over 0 g1 and g1 of x gr of x absolute value of h1 of x absolute value of hm of x okay and the goal in sqp is i want to minimize fx plus c px x is an rn where the penalty function is such that if you violate the constraint the penalty function will be positive so if your g1 of x is greater than zero or gr of x is greater than zero or h1 of x is non-zero or hm of x is non-zero the p of x will kick in and will make the objective positive and you add it to the function f of x and and uh, you try to minimize, con con conduct an unconstrained minimization of this objective function, and it leads to the optimal solution to the original problem. Okay, any question about this penalty function? So this is the penalty function, CPX. I hope it is clear by a mere inspection, violation of constraint will make this penalty positive. So violating any constraint will appear as penalty in objective function. Okay, that's the idea in sequential quadratic programming. So what do we know about this, uh, this unconstrained minimization problem? So let me recall a theorem or a proposition. So X star is optimal and regular second order sufficient condition is satisfied and C is greater than summation lambda I star plus summation mu J star J equals one to R, I equals one to M. Then x star equals to argmin fx plus c cx x is an rn so i want you to think about it and ask me any questions you may have
Okay, so you have an optimal and regular point, second order sufficient condition is satisfied, and your C is sufficiently large. Well, how what what's what's the meaning of sufficiently large here? Well, it should be greater than the sum of absolute value of all the Lagrange multipliers of the problem. So remember, mu j star is always non-negative. Lambda i star could be positive or negative, so that's why you take the absolute value. And as long as c is strictly greater than the sum, um, what you're guaranteed is x star is going to be an unconstrained minimum of the function plus the penalty function, the objective function plus the penalty function. Okay. Now, our next goal is to come up with an iterative scheme to solve this minimization problem. So can someone tell me, look at this objective function. So it's fx plus c max of a bunch of different functions. What's the problem with, uh, what's the problem with this sort of um, minimization problem? or trying to solve. So if you want to solve this minimization problem, what, what kind of problems are you going to encounter? Say you want to use gradient descent to solve this problem. What's, what's a key issue with gradient descent in this problem? px may not be differentiable, that's right. So px is not differentiable or may not be differentiable. So it is particularly not differentiable wherever two constraints are active. So. So if this is your x, this is your g1 of x, this is your g2 of x, and this is zero, this is your p of x, and there are two points this point and this point at which your p of x is not differentiable. It doesn't have a well-defined derivative at this point, at these two points. Okay, so p of x is, so p of x is differentiable in this region, differentiable in this region, differentiable in this region, but it's not differentiable at these two points. So penalty is not differentiable. So how should we go about solving such a minimization problem? That's the key question. Okay, any, any comments or concerns at this point of time? No? Okay. Well, so the problem is Px is not differentiable. So let's try to go back even one step before we encountered gradient descent. So when we were talking about gradient descent, so gradient descent was, uh, the class of gradient descent algorithms was basically minimizing the first order or second order Taylor series expansion of the objective function. So let's try and understand what would a Taylor series expansion of P of X is gonna look like. And based on that, we will try to come up with an algorithm to solve this problem. So before that, I want to 
just write down an idea which will come handy later on, which is if I have minimum of F0 of X plus max of F1 of X comma F2 of X, this is equivalent to minimum X over Rn C in R, F0 of X plus C such that so these two problems are equivalent. You can of course have any number of functions f1 to fn and you can expand this inequality in any way you want. I mean, not in any way, but uh, you will have corresponding set of inequalities for as many functions as you have in the maximum. Okay. Let's hope that you can convince yourself about this uh, um, you can convince yourself of this uh, expression uh, later on, perhaps after the class. If you have questions, you can ask me, but uh, it's really a trivial computation to sh show this equivalence between the two optimization problems. Okay, so let's try to do Taylor series approximation. Actually, let me do it on a separate page. If you have any questions, you can ask me now. Okay, so let's, let me do one thing. I, I have this problem. I want to uh, do some simplification of the notation in order to make it easier to, uh, to write the notation. So I have this problem that I started with. I'm going to transform it to the following problem. So hx less than equal to zero minus minus hx less than equal to zero, gx less than equal to zero. So I can convert this equality constraint problem into two inequality constraint problems. So that leads me to this expression. So I can totally consider the following problem where I want to minimize fx such that g1 dj of x less than equal to zero j equals one to r because i can convert any problem into this inequality constraint problem so let's just consider inequality constraint problem for the purpose of this discussion okay so that's number one and well, not number one. So that's, that's the first step. And the second step is I'm going to define my P of X as max of zero G1 of X, GJ of X. And I'm going to define J of X equals to J, G, G, R, J in 
1 to r such that I'm trying to think if I should, yeah, let me put zero as well. So this is my G zero of X. So these are the set of active constraints where G zero of X equal to zero is, is also considered as one of the constraints. Any questions so far? I think the uh, conversion is straightforward. So any quality constraint can be split into two sets of inequality constraints. So I can just consider a problem with inequality constraint. I form the corresponding penalty function and define the set of active constraints for this penalty function. Okay, now I want to come up with the first order Taylor series expansion of this um, of this uh, objective function. Okay, so what's the Taylor series expansion of f of x plus alpha d? Uh, one over two. Well, let me just write small o of alpha. Small o f of alpha. Okay. C max of Now I can do the same Taylor series expansion for G0, G1 and all that. So what I'm going to get is small o zero of alpha, small o of alpha. So I have a pretty long expression. Little o of one, uh, does it uh, alpha square? Oh, sorry, this should be alpha. That's right. This is alpha. Thanks. There should be alpha here too. 
So I want to make sure I emphasize. So there is alpha here. This is O0 of alpha. Alpha here, O1 of alpha. Alpha here, OR of alpha. <clears throat> Okay. So one thing I can uh, I can maybe approximate here is assuming that alpha is small, uh, this term O0 of alpha, OR of alpha, all these terms are going to be negligible. So this is approximately equal to fx plus alpha gradient fx transpose d plus c max gjx plus alpha gjx transpose d j in capital j x plus small o of alpha this is an approximation okay this is not an equality this is an approximation Okay. So what's the value of GJ of X when J is in J capital J of X? Okay, so let me repeat the question. So what's the value of GJ of X when J is in capital J of X? G of X. P of X. Great. Okay, so now uh, I hope everyone has followed until this particular point, until this approximation, because now I'm going to write I'm going to collect all the terms together. Alpha max of plus small o of alpha plus alpha fx transpose t plus c max j in capital j of x This term without the alpha is referred to as theta C X colon D or semicolon D. And the property, so this is the first order Taylor series expansion of F of X plus C P X. Um, this Approximation makes perfect sense when alpha is very, very small. And 
what is inside the bracket is referred to as theta c x of d and a property of the optimal solution is x star x star optimal solution if and only if theta c x star d is non-negative for all d in Rn. So no matter which which direction d you want to take a step in your theta c d theta c is supposed to be non-negative at x star Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so what's the direction we need to take um, in order to do the gradient descent? Okay, for this non differentiable penalty function. So that's the next step that I want to go to. So if there are no further questions, I'll move on to the next step. So the gradient descent, oh, this is the sequential quadratic programming algorithm. So I want to pick D such that f of x plus alpha d plus c p of x plus alpha d is less than, well, pick dk such that fxk plus alpha dk, well, let me rewrite the whole thing, such that f of xk plus alpha dk plus c p xk plus alpha dk is less than f of xk plus cpxk. Okay, so I need this, uh, I need dk to satisfy this property. And I can do the first order Taylor series business to figure out that I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize d in Rn of gradient fxk transpose t plus half d transpose hkd plus c Okay, typically you would pick, oh, you would pick HK to be identity matrix or some second derivative of the Lagrangian or whatever. You can compute easily some approximation thereof of uh, the second derivative of the Lagrangian. And this is what the descent direction D should look like. It should satisfy this set of problem. I mean, this this is a min max min max optimization problem because you are doing the minimization of some term which doesn't depend on j, and then c maximum over some terms that depends on j. Oh, uh, I need to put x k here. I need to put x k here. Yeah. So this is g j of x k and gradient of g j at x k. Okay, so now uh, I've gotten to this particular form, but it's still a min-max form, so it's not very clear how to solve the min-max form, uh, this min-max optimization uh, problem. So 
going back to an idea that I had mentioned in the first few minutes of the lecture, if I have a min-max problem of this type, I can write it equivalently as a problem where I'm doing minimum over one extra variable C and everything that's inside the maximization goes as constraint less than equal to C. So I'll just do the same transformation here. Oh. I will do minimum D in Rn Oh, C in R, and I want DJX plus DJXK plus gradient DJXK transpose T is less than equal to C for all J. So this big thing is sequential quadratic program, SQP algorithm. So at every point of time, you have to solve a quadratic program. So this is linear function of D, quadratic function of D, and then linear set of linear constraints on D. Okay, so this is, this is some constant transpose D, and this is also some constant, and C is an optimization variable. So this is actually a, a quadratic function of D linear in C. Uh, the constraints are linear in D and C. So it's a quadratic program. It's called a quadratic program. And at every point K, at every iteration K, you have to solve this quadratic program. And eventually you will converse to the optimal solution X star. Oh, how do you pick alpha K where you can pick alpha K according to any any rule, so xk plus one equals xk plus alpha k dk. So the argument of this solution would be dk. And this is the pick alpha k according to your favorite method. You can do minimization, line minimization, Armijo's rule. Um, you can use constant step size as well, but then there is a problem with constant step size that you may overshoot or undershoot uh, every time. So when you're close to the optimal solution, so constant step size becomes a problem with this type of algorithm. But nonetheless, you can get to the region of X star pretty quickly with this kind of algorithm even with constant step size. Okay. Any question on this uh, sequential quadratic program? I guess there should be one obvious question here, which is how do we pick the value of C? Remember in the, in the beginning, we mentioned that C has to be sufficiently large. So C has to be greater than the sum of absolute value of all the Lagrange multipliers. Um, but we don't quite know what the sum of values of Lagrange multipliers is going to be. So how are you going to pick the value of C? Assume you have no experience before 
you have started solving this problem. So if you have experience, you certainly know in which region your Lagrange multiplier would lie. And then you can appropriately pick a large enough value of C such that this is going to be larger than the sum of all the Lagrange multipliers, absolute value of Lagrange multipliers. What, ha what happens when you don't know what the region is going to be? Okay, so in that situation, you have to iteratively update the value of C. So you inherently have a CK here in case you don't know what a good estimate of C should be. So you put a CK there and the way you initialize C0, so you pick C0 equals to zero, you pick C equals to zero at the first instance when you are initializing the algorithm and then you compute the Lagrange multiplier. So you compute, of course, the D0 and pick X0, you pick C0 equals to zero, C equals to zero, compute D0 and the Lagrange multipliers, let me call it mu J zero. j equals to 0 to r and then you pick c1 equals to summation of mu j0 j equals 1 to r plus some positive number gamma okay and keep repeating this all the time until you see that the value of C has stabilized. So you don't go all the way to infinity. As long as you see that the value of C has stabilized, you drop this positive number gamma and you let the algorithm run with that kind of estimate of C. But certainly C should always be greater than the sum of Lagrange multipliers for the previous iteration. So let's say C K plus one should be max of ck and then the summation of mu jk j equals 1 to r plus gamma right max of these two numbers so this is the uh, estimate of c in the previous time step and this is the new estimate of c and the you take the maximum of these two estimates and that should be equal to your ck plus one So that's a usual strategy to adopt when you don't know the value of C that should be picked for running this algorithm. In this case, would you have a fixed gamma? And what, how would you go about yeah, choosing well, gamma? Yeah, you, you can typically pick gamma equals to five, 10 or something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. And you can also change the value of gamma over time. So it just depends on what makes the algorithm converge. So you will run a few trials um, and then try to identify what value of gamma would make sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to reiterate, we started with a constrained optimization problem. We came up with a penalty function so that the unconstrained minimum of fx plus cpx would be an optimal solution to the original problem. Then we came up with the first order Taylor series expansion and we realized that I need to pick a, a, a direction D that minimizes this objective function. But what was this objective function? So we had the usual quadratic term that we see in the gradient descent algorithms, but we also had a maximization over some linear functions of D. And the question was, how do you 
like how do you solve a min max problem and the other idea we had was in order to solve the min max problem let's push all the maximum quantities in the constraint and so what we get is a quadratic programming problem at every time step so for every xk i have to solve this quadratic programming problem where the objective function is quadratic in d linear in c and then the constraints are linear in c so this minimization is over both d and c and this leads us to this gives us a value of dk so solving a quadratic program is much easier than solving the original problem so i can solve the quadratic program rather easily i can get the value of dk i can pick my favorite alpha k to update the value of xk and that gives me the sequential quadratic program algorithm now of course one of the issues we found was well we don't know the value of c so we came up with a hacky approach to compute the value of c on the fly to make sure that our algorithm runs as intended so that's all i have for today if you have any questions i'll stick around for some time uh, but not a long time because i have another meeting starting at 3 and uh, i'll upload the lectures in a few minutes from now so talk to you guys on wednesday uh professor yes uh so this this kasi is uh, <clears throat> picked uh picked the picked the at the beginning of the algorithm and uh, it's fixed uh, so we don't update this kasi like kasi 1 kasi 2 this one uh, no no i mean i mean uh, this one yes yes this one is the optimization variable itself so you are minimizing over all c as well oh i see thank you so much yeah yeah great so no further questions i'm going to stop the recording now